You know, farming was a vital, vital part of the life of the ancient Near East. Actually, farming is a vital part of life, period. But the farming of the ancient Near East, it's important if we know something about it, it will certainly help us to understand biblical verses. Let's go to Ecclesiastes, please. If you're reading along in your Bible, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 11. And here, the, the, the text tells us, the words of the wise are as goads. Like, okay, the words of the wise are as goads. What, what's that mean? What's that referring to? The goad was a very, very common instrument in the ancient Near East. And the reason for that was, like I said, farming was such a vital part of the culture. The goad, sometimes called an ox goad or a cattle goad, was a pointed stick. Um, I'd say six feet to eight feet long generally. And this is one of the things that we have to learn as we're studying customs and culture is that there, there wasn't like a model for everything. For example, let's take um, a pin, just a plain old ballpoint pin in the United States. You say, what does a pin look like? Well, we have a general idea of what a pin looks like. But some of them are skinny, some of them are fat, some of them are colored, some of them have little, uh, you know, like little animals or something on the top. Some of them, uh, they, they all differ. They're, they, they serve the same function. They're in the same ballpark. You can look at one and see, hey, this is a pen. But if somebody were to say, draw a picture of the American pen. <laughs> well, you couldn't do it. And the same is true with so many things in the ancient Near East. An ox goads a stick, and, and the guy's gone out and he's gathered it out of the forest. It's going to be six or eight feet long, basically because what it's used for is keeping the oxen in line, or, or the cattle, or what's ever pulling your plow. Because when the the field got soft and after the rain started about October and the man is plowing his field, especially when you're training the young cattle. You get a, a young ox or a young cow and they don't want to plow and particularly they don't want to plow in a straight line. So they're going to go over here or go over here, or go back to the stall or wander off to the grass or whatever. And just like if you have a pet dog, when you first get a puppy and you begin to puppy, uh, you begin to train the puppy, housebreak the puppy, train it to come, train it to sit. It's the same thing with a work animal like an ox. They need to be trained. And so when you, when you put the oxen in the yoke and they start to plow, then the man who was plowing would also have a goad that he was holding onto. And the reason it would have to be six or eight feet is he's got to be able to reach up to the shoulder of that animal because you're, you're plow, the man's plowing along and the animal starts to drift off or wander off toward grass over here on the right and he takes that goad, this pointed stick, and he goes and he kind of just pokes it in the shoulder. Now the point of the goad, it's not like a whip for a horse that, you know, you're not going fast enough, you know, poke the animal in the rump. That, that wasn't the point of the goad to, to cause a lot of pain. It was just to, to, to catch the animal's attention and say, no, this is what you're going to do. This is the direction you're going to go in. And it was used to train the animal. So here's the man plowing and he's, he's holding on. The animal starts to drift. No, poke, you're going here. Now, I guess if the animal did stop and didn't respond to verbal commands, then you could give a little poke in the rump and, and get it going. But this was the point of an ox goad. And, most of them, well, most of the farm, farmers were poor, so it would just simply be a stick. You don't want it to be really heavy because you're going to have to carry it <laughs> all the time you're plowing. You're holding on to the plow and you're holding on to the stick. So you don't want a, you know, a giant 15-pound stick. You want a, 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 a fairly light but long but sturdy stick. And then they would sharpen the end that they're going to poke the animal with. Now, some of the wealthier farmers may have actually had uh, maybe a little bronze point on the end of the stick. And I've even read in some customs books where 
The, the, the back side of the goad would have, in some cases, a little bronze piece or a little iron piece that was flattened and then used to scrape the plow because after you plow, and if you've ever been to a, a farm and seen the plow blades, after they plow for a while, they get mud caked on them and then somebody needs to take the, the, the plow blade and, and scrape the mud off it so that it can be more effective. And so here's this goad and it was six, eight feet long, usually just a pointed stick, sometimes might have iron or, or bronze as a point and perhaps even iron or bronze as a flat blade on the back end uh, so that people could go, uh, so people could clean their plows. So this is when, for example, if you read Judges, chapter 3, verse 31, here is Shamgar, who delivered Israel, it says, and after him was Shamgar, son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad. Boy, that, what an amazing warrior. What an amazing faith lesson. Here's a man who takes an ox goad and he kills 600 Philistines. <laughs> That's, that's pretty amazing. You know, he could have sat around and complained that what he had wasn't good enough. But instead, he took what he had and he used it for God's purposes. What a great faith lesson for you and me, huh? You know, so many times I talk to people, and if I had a better this, if I had a better that, if I had a better computer, if I had a car, we always want to try to improve. I'm not saying we don't want to try to improve, but let's take what we have and get the most out of it. Here's a man who, with the power of God, killed 600 of the enemy with a stick, a pointed stick. God delivered Israel, it says. And then, you know, you also see, for example, in 1 Samuel 13, 21, that the Philistines charged the Israelites a, 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 a fee uh, to sharpen the axes and for setting the goads. And when you read, if you read 1 Samuel 13, 21 about setting the goads, there's some discussion as to whether the, the Hebrew text should be sharpen the goad, it's obviously both the, the point and the, and the flat blade needed sharpening, or whether it really referred to fixing them on the end of the stick. And there's some discussion about that from the Hebrew text, and frankly, we're not sure. But in any case, the, the Philistines worked with the Israelites in sharpening their and, and fixing their goads. Now, there's an interesting use of, the, of goad in Acts 26, 14. It says, this is referring to the Apostle Paul, who at that time was known as Saul, when Jesus first appeared to him. And it says, and when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. What's Jesus talking about? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. <laughs> See, I'm sure that when Paul was going out arresting Christians, throwing Christians in jail, all that time they were talking to him about the Messiah. You know, you're, you're wrong, Saul. You're wrong in what you're doing. Jesus is the Messiah. Saul, you're waiting for the promised Messiah. Jesus is the promised Messiah. And, and Saul was rejecting all of that. No, 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 you're wrong. You, you know, he wasn't the Messiah. He was an imposter. And so when Jesus appeared to him, he says, Saul, you know, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. What's Jesus referring to? Well, sometimes you'd tell that animal, you know, that you want it to go to the right or the left and poke on it and it, it get mad and it start kicking. And when that animal would start kicking, then you take the goad and you just put it behind the leg. And as that animal would kick, it would kick right into the goad and it would hurt. And eventually the animal would learn. And, and you and I are supposed to learn from the goads of God, which brings me back to where we started, which it says, the words of the wise are like goads. And so I'd like to offer you a challenge. Do you have wise friends? Do you consider yourself a wise person? You know, our words are supposed to prick people sometimes. They're supposed to guide people. They're supposed to get people moving. Let's not make sure that, let's make sure that not all of our words are so syrupy and so sugary that, um, that we, we never really spur one another on to love and get good works. The words of the wise are like goads. Thank you.